right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's great that you're taking advantage of this resource and we appreciate everyone's uh, flexibility. We've all had to learn to be, to, to be different and handle this, this new world we live in. And, and one of those ways it's kind of been, you know, with every crisis, there's an opportunity and there's been an opportunity we've seen we were trying to do these webinars kind of before this whole COVID thing and had some success, but we've seen much more involvement since this happened and people are embracing um, embracing technology and, and the ways that we can try to connect. So I guess I'm grateful we live in the days we live in where we have that option. If this was 1920 when we had the flu epidemic, I you know, boy, social distancing meant really social distancing. So we can be grateful we can meet like this and have these discussions. So. I do hope you'll kind of fire questions over um, so we can answer them and kind of have a discussion about it. But, but we're going to just talk a little bit of today about one of the one of the you know most difficult and and challenging aspects of life, and that is just managing the financial stress. You know, so uh, I'm, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what the issues are, and I hope by the end of this that you will have a few tools in your tool belt, a few ideas. If you find as we go through this that maybe there's just some like, hey, you, you had a pretty good idea about some of this material and had a pretty good sense of it, then that would be a good, you know, kind of self check to say, you know, I, I do have um, a lot of knowledge, I kind of know what to do. Then the question would be, how do you apply it? I find that with financial stress, as, as well as any other kind of thing I see people work through, um, that there's material doesn't mean anything, uh, unless you find a way to implement it in your life. And there's, there's this difference between where our, no, where our memories are created and our knowledge and where it becomes habit. If you ever wanna see a fascinating kind of discussion about that, there's a book called uh, The Power of Habit. And in there they had this, this man who was a, 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 had this rare brain disease that killed just a very specific part of the cells in his brain, just a very specific place. And it's really kind of in, in your memory um, center. <clears throat> where a lot of his uh, those cells were killed. And so he was unable to create or, or replicate or kind of get access to some memories that were created. And he'd be sitting in his living room and the researchers asked him where the kitchen was and he couldn't tell you where the kitchen was. He didn't know. But what, at the time that it became, when they said, hey, let's go get a bite to eat, he just stood up and walked to the kitchen. You think, well, you remember where the kitchen is. We associate and believe that when we go to the kitchen, it's because I remembered where it was. But in reality, our bodies and our brains are able to do a lot of things without our memories being involved. It's all about habit. And so what I'd like to help us do is think about how we can create these memories, information that you have about your knowledge of finances and create new habits, both the habits in changing how you handle your money and how you handle your stress around your money. So I'd ask you to kind of approach today and think about and, and take stock and say, is that something I need to, is that new information for me? And if it is, what do I need to do with it? And if it's not new for you, ask yourself, how am I going to do something different with it now? Um, I'll give me a short example before I jump into some of the information here. Uh, I, I know that one of the most common and known things that we can do to handle our stress is breathing. It is of all the things that we've learned, even beyond some of the medications available, this a simple breathing exercise. And I've seen it powerfully done with people I've worked with who are in the middle of a panic attack and were calm 10 minutes later through just good breathing exercises. And yet in a seminar like this, I asked everybody to raise their hand. I said, you all deal with stress. And you, how many of you knew that breathing was one of the most important things you could focus on during your stress? And almost everybody raised their hand. And I said, and how many of you the last time you were having significant stress, stopped and paid attention to your breathing and did something different with it. And only a couple hands went up. So we often overlook those th most powerful, simple things when we go to um, get into our challenges, our stress. So I want you to kind of just think about that and ask yourself, take stock. What do I know that we've talked about? And then what am I doing with that knowledge? Okay, so here we go. You all remember this, uh, little, uh, sorry, um, Alice in Wonderland story, the famous story of Alice when she meets a Cheshire cat. And she says, would you tell me please, which way I ought to go from here? She's lost in the woods and hopes that the cat's gonna help her find her way. And the cat says, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. 
I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. And Addis, Alice, finishing her comment, said, so long as I get somewhere. The cat said, oh, and you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. So the, 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 the moral of that story is we're all headed somewhere. We're all headed somewhere. Financially, you're going somewhere. Whether you plan it or not, you are heading somewhere financially. It could be to that uh, financial uh, oasis and bliss and <laughs> happiness and security, really, is what we're talking about. You could be towards that security. It could be, what is it you're looking to head towards? And then once you decide what that is, then we can talk about how to get there. Because if you don't plan, then that somewhere is probably gonna be just wherever your natural inclinations take you. And that isn't always a good place. <laughs> and by the way, that somewhere isn't entirely up to you. You know, there's some things that are outside our control, but we certainly can take a lot more control over it and give ourselves our best odds. Stack the dice in our favor. So what is the purpose of financial planning? And my concern about throwing this slide up so early is financial planning, that word just might put you to sleep. Many of us are like, oh, financial planning. It just that sounds like calculus or, or whatever, right? It's just like, oh, that poor term. So we're not going to get into deep financial planning. Uh, there are financial planners who will get into some of the most specifics. And that, by the way, as many of you are like, I love financial planning. It's very fascinating for you. But when it comes right down to it, what financial planning is nothing more than just de de defining your goals and where you want to be. That's what financial planning really is. And it won't make you money, but it will certainly help your money work for you and make your, your uh, help you plan how your money works a little bit better. So money is, what is money, right? It's, we have all kinds of stories about money. Some of us see it as the root of all evil, or it could be the can't buy happiness and all the negative stories about money. But there's also um, a lot of ways that you can gain your freedom and do things. You can, you can retire early and go, go do service. You can, you can give to people who are poor and need or need with your money. You can, you can do a lot of powerful things. You can create memories and go places and do things like that. But what does money really represent? It's more than just currency. It's yes, it's officially just an exchange of goods. It's a way that instead of trading my chickens for your milk, we're gonna we're gonna just buy the we're gonna have an exchange of money and then I will go buy the milk. So it's it's how we exchange. Um, <clears throat> I'd like you to think about what it is that money means for you and what is it kind of lifestyle. So take money out of the picture and think about lifestyle for a minute. What is it you want in one, five, or ten, or thirty years? I would encourage you as, as you leave this to spend some time on that and think about and create that image where there's vision. Whether there's no vision, the people perish. Where there is vision, people have a, have a, a place, a dis destination, and they know where they want to go. So create that vision. What is it you want that to look like? And then, by the way, once you've created the picture, the outline, then be flexible. Because, by the way, it's not going to look exactly like you created. Be flexible and adapt to what changes. But still start with the end in mind. Think about what your top three major goals are. Be specific. Create what that is. Not just, I want to have a good retirement, but what does that mean? What kind of, what kind of lifestyle do I want there? Last one here is write your epitaph. Isn't that interesting? This is where you can de determine your values, what's important to you, and then we can see where money intersects with that. You'll see that your values and what you want to accomplish in your life, and to some degree, depends on your freedom to, to go do those things. It's hard to go do those things when you're burdened with the financial stress or don't have the kind of flexibility and freedom that comes with financial security. So think about your epitaph. And then, and then as you think about your epitaph, which is sort of like, hey, my ode to my life and what that means and, and what would people say and what do I want people to have said about me? Think about where your financial freedom plays into that. And then money no longer becomes just this ugly, dirty thing that we're just supposed to have and it ruins kind of the fun. So let's think about the part that money plays in that and then create those goals. A vision then becomes a plan. You create goals for those medium, short and long term. That's my challenge to you. What do we know about money and what, it, what, is, what effect it has on us? Well, let's look at that. Let's look and see that right now, We'd say that pre-COVID, and these are obviously not too long ago, but 80% of people said that money was their number one stressor. Can you believe that? 80% of 
four and five said it was number one. Do you think that's changed in COVID? Maybe a little bit for some, maybe it's gotten worse for others. I don't know if it's number one anymore, but it's certainly a challenge. 78% live paycheck to paycheck. Well, it's about the same amount of people. No wonder it's number one stressor, right? About the same number of people said that they just, they would, if they, without that next check, they're gonna be real challenges. 77% said that they're anxious about their financial situation. I'm just gonna kind of cycle through some of these. 56% have no budget whatsoever. 40% were one check away from poverty. One missed check away from poverty. That's the definition of living paycheck to paycheck. Okay, look at your situation. If you're, oops, I'll go back. If that fits you, I want you to know you're in good company. All those are very high numbers. Even the 28, 29% puts you in a lot, um, in a lot of stress and among a lot of company. And there's always a little bit of peace and knowing I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who's challenged with this. If you aren't one of those, then you can say, great, I, you know, I, I celebrate that I'm, I was, I'm fortunate enough to not have some of those challenges. And what, what, what can I do to keep it that way and keep moving forward? Those are pretty staggering numbers. We, we have a financial crisis in our country and around the world and how we manage our money. Okay, what is it doing? It is a leading cause among marital disruption and divorce. It is one of the highest causes people report. It's a high contributor to the feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness, experience and depression. One of the key symptoms of depression, in my opinion, the most dangerous, the one that keeps us locked in is hopelessness. And when you feel like, when you look at your financial situation and feel like there is there is no way out, and there's nothing I can do, I, I feel like I'm just, just trying to keep my nose above water. That is what hopelessness feels like and hope financial problems can, can contribute to that significantly. And anxiety. Anxiety is the scourge of our time. From a mental health perspective, anxiety is on a huge increase. Um, we're doing things here. We're creating anxiety programs. If you're interested, call us. And you're, if you have the Blum Costale benefit, then give us a call and, and talk, ask us about our anxiety program because we're doing some significant things about that. Family relationships and money. So, so money represents more than exchange of goods. It represents power. Think about it. It represents the exchange of power. I, as the parent, as a parent in my home, <laughs> it certainly represents power. I will give you money as you do your things. And it, for me, it means I can actually uh, bribe my children and, and get them to do things with money. And that's a very, very rudimentary form of that, but it represents power in so many ways. It sure does. Values. It represents our values. And money, even if, even if you don't value money, well, money still represents your values. How you spend it represents what you value. And you're obviously spending it on food because you value living. And you spend it on utilities because you value having those things. Beyond, beyond that, think about what it is that you spend. You can say all day long, I value charitable giving. But if you don't do it, what does that say, right? Um, if, if you can't and you would, that's, that's one thing, right? So what does that mean? What, is, what do I value is what I, I speak that with my money. It's, it, it's a coping thing, okay? And this is where we get into some of our, some of the challenges. A lot of times I'll, I'll meet with people and I, I know <laughs> on what a budget is. I know how I'm supposed to do it. I just can't do it. I, I feel like I'm blocked. And when you look at these issues, you can see why we're blocked. Sometimes it becomes how we cope. And it's just like alcohol and drugs and other bad habits, we turn to spending to cope. And I know how it feels. Like I'm raising my hand. I hope you, I'm not alone here that it feels good to spend when I'm feeling down. Like it's how I can feel like, Oh man, you know, today was a rough day. I'm going to, I'm going to get on Amazon. That's Amazon therapy or retail therapy. Like you just get on and it feels better. You feel better, but just like alcohol, too much of it, you use it. If you do it to feel better, to cope. And next thing you know, your life is worse. You're, you're swimming in debt and you, you turn to it again. Spending can be just like any other addiction, even if it's, you know, it doesn't have the same chemical response. It can be, it can be very damaging. It can be how we try to, in our relationships, you know, if I'm not, if you're not getting along with your spouse, you might think, oh, you know what? A nice, nice jewelry would fix this problem or, or just, hey, let's go out and buy something together. It makes us feel better together. So it's how we cope. It also represents security, money, that feeling, and so many people, you know, they 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 don't even spend their money. So they, in case of of a problem, they have it, and they they live in that security. It all represents freedom. Money gives us freedom. I'm having it, 
and not having it takes it away. You know, when we're in sort of financial servitude to people, that is a thing, you know, that uh, back in the Babylonian days, if you were in enough debt, you literally became, you know, in servitude to somebody until you could get out of debt. And even though it's not that official anymore, it feels like that if you're in debt. It feels like the mortgage company owns you because they could kick you out of your home at any time. And so that's what that feels like for people. Methods of joint management, right? So we're going to talk about in terms of how money works within our within our sales and relationships, there are different ways we manage money. I'm not going to get into great detail about this, but one is unilateral. So that's sort of like where one person's in charge. You know, that I, I have the money, I take care of the money, and I'll let you know what you get. And then you have shared and then divided. Shared is kind of like we share it together. It's all pooled. We just kind of work through that together. Divided is we cut it in half and then you could take care of this, I'll take care of that, or you cut it by your check or my check. You know, you know, my, my bias is probably shared with some level of divided where it's needed. For example, saying it's shared, but saying, you know, let's keep some separate accounts to manage it a little bit would be, I think, the best kind of thing for a relationship. But I've seen people that, are, that know themselves and say, you know what, my spouse is so much better at handing money than me. We'll make shared decisions about money. But in terms of managing it, I prefer my spouse kind of a unilateral approach. Like I, I'm okay with him or her kind of being in charge of that a little bit because it works better for us. I, that's okay too, as long as it's a shared decision and how they do that. Plan of action, right? What is your plan going to be? What uh, needs to be flexible? So as you think about this, as we go through this a little further, think about how your plan needs to be flexible. Remember how I said, create a vision, be detailed with it, but then accept that, you know what, the best, you, you can ask the painters, the creators of movies and books, the best, most creative projects came from having a vision and then seeing how it morphs and changes as you get into it. And you find that what you ended up with was better than what you wanted. Instead of seeking your the happily ever after, seek for a happily ever after, because you'll look back and it will be the happily ever after that you wanted, but you didn't know you wanted it. So seek, seek, be flexible, and you want to have some liquidity in, in, in your plan. Think about what that means. It means it's available to you. Some things probably shouldn't be, right? Some things you want to have keep away. 401ks are designed, retirement plans are usually designed to make it really kind of punish you if you try to take it out. And that's for your own benefit and the governments, if you go ahead and do it from a tax perspective, but that's so that you are not tempted to use it until uh, we do that on purpose. Um, things should also be protective. Think about how they protect it from taxes, from other people getting to it um, that shouldn't be their money, <laughs> and it should be tax-friendly as we talked about. So what is financial freedom? Financial freedom, and here's an interesting quote, right? It doesn't depend on how much money you have. It's about what you do with it and the power you have over your fears and anxieties instead of the other way around. And by that definition, I can have complete financial freedom and even be in, fi in, in financial disarray. You can choose to not wait until you're out of debt to feel that freedom. Some of that will be difficult to do if you're indebted, but you can create a mindset of, I'm not going to let this problem own me. Nothing takes me. Even if my debtors are knocking the door down, this does not own me. It's, if you want to read a book about the, the ultimate level of that, it's Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And it's a great book that illustrates when other people are in control, you can gain an inner control that they cannot take from you. I knew a family, and you've heard these stories too, that lived down the street from me. They, he was a school teacher, and she was a stay-at-home mom. And they were able to pay off their home and go to Hawaii when their oldest was having her senior trip and had, and had no debt whatsoever. Their home was paid off, their cars, everything was paid off. And that's on a, on, you know, we would say a teacher's income isn't always what we'd like it to be. And yet with just seven children, by the way, I, didn't, I failed to mention that part, seven children, this, this person, I look at them and say, I don't have any excuse. <laughs> if they can get to that point on there, that, and they, they, they live, they didn't, they didn't have this, this lifestyle that didn't allow them to live. They just were re responsible with it. So what are the tools? And again, take stock. You're going to know some of these. I'm not going to go into necessarily great detail. I'm hoping to share a few tidbits that I hope will be helpful for you to think about. What are the tools? Well, having a budget. 
And I know that's the word that sometimes just really puts us off. It feels constraining. And so what I would say about a budget is you are the owner and not the other way around. As soon as your budget owns you, you will, you will rebel. You will either rebel or become just, just unhappy <laughs> in your life because the budget does not own you. And what do I mean by that? If you develop, develop a budget and you have $100, for example, of, of expendable money that you get to choose to do whatever you want with, and you have $100 in your lawn budget, your yard budget, <laughs> that's a lot for a month probably, but let's just keep it round numbers. And you do that. Well, let's say that a month later, and you're like, you know what? I don't need that much for my yard. And I would like a little bit more money for, for those other things. I'm going to change that. But here's the key is I'm going to go back to the budget and negotiate a change with my partner. How are we doing? We're going to have a change. The budget is flexible. That's still a budget because we're still deciding where money's coming from. That, as long as you're deciding you're in a budget, it doesn't have to be stat. You know, hey, we live by a budget. We stay with it all year long. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know that you need to do it that way. You can change what we do, but we just need to know where it's coming from. What doesn't work is when you say, that's not enough money for our fun budget. I'm just going to spend more without any idea of where that's coming from. Then you go out and spend $100 on yard equipment. Guess what? That didn't really work out. So as long as we're, we're seeing where it comes from, one of the takeaways I hope you would take from this is that your budget can be a month by month change as long as you actually make it balance. Okay. Here's the old way of budgeting. Here's what we learned the old way was that you take your income minus your expenses and then you have what's left over for savings. And that's not bad wisdom. And by the way, if everybody did this, we wouldn't have the financial stress we have. It's not horrible. And well, those, that, that savings, as you can see by the arrow there, that's what goes to your, towards your personal goals. It's not, a, it's not a horrible way, but there's a better way. Their better way is to live by the principle of a book I like that's super old. It's written back in the mid part of the last century. And it's called The Richest Man in Babylon. And it's an a kind of an analogy or a parable of a person who lived in servitude in the Babylonian days and how they gained financial freedom. And the first rule that they teach you is that 10% of all I own is mine to keep. And the key is there is mine to keep, not just mine to waste, that the first 10% of all I own is mine to keep. And if you pay yourself first, most of us don't even consider things like Medicare and uh, I'm drawing a blank on all the other things that we pay up front, obviously our taxes and, and our insurance and things like that, um, FICA and all that stuff that we pay, we don't even think about that because it's already been taken out before. We, we don't budget for that. And if you take that same mentality and don't even budget in your budget, your, your personal goals money, your pay yourself money, that 10% is paid before you do that. Many people to approach that with their charitable giving. Well, consider that in that same 10%, by the way, <laughs> many, do, many do it that way. If you do that with you paying yourself, then you, you are, you are then putting yourself and your family and those that you love ahead of the debtors. And then you will budget accordingly. Then your expenses. And by the way, if you still have other savings, whew, nice, put them, throw them back into the goals. I'm not going to go into great detail about, about this, but you pay yourself first. I think I've covered this. You mentally establish the saving as a priority. You're creating a mentality within yourself and your home that saving is a priority. Um, it does create better habits and you build a better cash buffer for when the world happens. Um, we have this crisis that comes around every year, this financial crisis we don't expect. It's called Christmas. <laughs> every year it catches us by surprise. But if we think about it, it's coming next year and it's going to come the year after that. And are we planning for it? Some things we can plan for. What I don't know if it's going to happen next year is my car is going to break down and need major expenses or not. I probably should consider that there's a good chance it will happen in the future. Just when is the, is the key? There will, there will be a financial crisis in every one of our lives. Just to what degree and, and how, how prepared will we be and what will it be? So what are the tips? Pay cash when possible. Now that's tricky. When we say cash, let's think of virtual cash as an option, Deb, debit cards. Um, 
you know, Venmo income straight from my checking account. I consider that a cash transaction. The advantage of actual cold cash is it does make us think twice, like this is real money. It doesn't feel like it's just coming out of the air. Um, I call oh, everywhere I go now, they're saying, please don't give us money, give us credit cards because cash apparently, I, I don't know, some, someone can explain to me why all of a sudden money is so hard to, coins especially, you're all of a sudden, like, I don't know, someone just hoarding it all. I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> uh, pay cash when possible create specific funds for special occasions. One of the advantages of the days we live in is you can create sub accounts, uh, multiple sub accounts within your checking account. Say, this is our savings. This is our charitable giving. This is our, our fun. This is towards the thing that we want to buy the boat someday. You can, you can do that. The Christmas fund um, that you're, you're setting up for the holidays, you can create specific special funds for that. And then, and then telling other people, enlisting accountability, Accountability thrust upon me is no fun, but enlisting people to in accountability and saying, can you help me stick with my, my goals and, and keep me accountable to that? Don't create bills so you won't be able to pay the full at the end of the month. So the idea is that if I can't, if I'm accounting on this being forwarded, I've got a problem. Um, paying, paying things on time. These are hopefully very you know obvious things. Of course you wanna pay on time, it helps everything, okay? Wants and needs. This is an important self-check. And this, by the way, oh boy, you know, what, what really is a need when you really think about it? What's a want? I think that we would say, if we're honest with ourselves, that what we call a need is so often really just a want. So give a give close consideration to that. And this is how you do that. How does it, how do I feel? What what feelings are involved? Is this purchase part of my spending plan? Is this something I need or I want? How long did it take me to earn this money about to spend? One of the ways it's a really good test on this is to say, you know, I deserve this, this thing today. I deserve this new pickleball equipment. It's the best equipment. I deserve it. And, and to do it, I had to earn work this many hours. So there it comes at a cost. Do I deserve to lose that many hours at of time that it could be used for other things like what do i deserve because you're getting more than just the pickleball equipment you're getting the loss of income or money from that so do i deserve that too so think about the consequences and if it's worth it then there you go but if it's not then you know it's not <laughs> do i have other things i would rather use this money for you have to think about the opportunity cost it's not a question of do i get this or not it's like what am i going to lose as a result of this okay Healthy money habits to practice, of course. Uh, the, this is why I want you to just kind of do a little internal checkup. Um, are you making contributions? And your uh, every time you get a raise, your yearly raise, or just opportunities. When it happens, are you incrementally and kind of correspondingly adding money to your retirement? If your contributions to your retirement were the same before you got your raise, then you just change the percentage plan, and you're not preparing for for retirement save part of your income, take, track your cash spending, carry a limited amount of cash, okay? Pay bills as they arrive, pay yourself first, we talked about that. There's just some other things, take stock. Ask yourself, maybe look at this and say, and this will be up as a recording after we're done here, probably, I don't know, if it takes a day or so, probably. You can go back through these items and say, rate myself from one to 10. That's my challenge to you. Go back and say from one to 10, 10 being I'm amazing at this, I feel like I got this down, and one being I, this is horrible for me. Um, rate yourself. And then set a identify a couple of these areas where you're weakest. If I, if I impulse buy is my three on this list, and I'm doing six and seven everywhere else, I'm gonna focus on never impulse buying. And I'm gonna ask myself to get to a six, like I am at the other numbers, and then identify what does that even mean? What does a six look like in impulse buying? Well, it means I do it, I do it three or four times a week now. A six would be two times a week. Like set goals and, and celebrate when you reach them. <laughs> Not by spending more money, but find another way. <laughs> Spend less than you are. Isn't that the most obvious one? I mean, isn't that when it comes right down to it? It's, it's the most obvious one, but it's, it's what we're horrible at sometimes. Uh, debt. Right, so that's when that, that's when debt comes in, and when we spend more than what we have, and it's so easy to get it. That's part of our problem is we probably made it too easy, but but there we go. There's good debt and bad debt. I think we probably consider usually our our a home a good debt because it can increase in value. 
uh, depending on though how much you spend, it could be a bad debt. Bad debt or rent is 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 just a, it's consumption. It's I get nothing from it. Like I I spend it and there's no it, it's consumed and it's good. That was an amazing taco, but it's bad debt because I spent I use credit for it and it doesn't have any value in the future other than it kept me going today. That's bad debt, right? So your bad debt over your an, annual income. So good debt would be like your home, things that can increase in value that, that are good for you. But if your bad debt of your annual income is more than 25%, then you've got a problem. So again, we're, we're giving you a pass on your home for that. But other things that, that are out there, if it's more than 25% that you're spending on things that are just consumed, then you've got, that's bad debt. The debt snowball. So how do we pay off debt? Bad debt. The debt snowball approach is becoming more and more known. I, I would be interested in how many of you know of the debt snowball. I, I, I think it'd be a good idea to have polls. I Maybe mean, it's something we could look at in the future, have polls, but I'd be interested in how many of you are aware of this. It's become more and more popular. It was around before Dave Ramsey, but Dave Ramsey's popularized it a lot. If you're familiar with Dave Ramsey and wonderful, good advice there. Um, but the idea of the debt snowball is that sometimes we have this sort of stay afloat approach. Like I'm just going to appease and pay a little extra to all my, makes me feel better to put an extra 10 or $15 to all the people I owe. And I'm trying to get out of debt. But instead of doing that, tackle the smallest one first, because then what happens is you can take whatever that minimum was plus the little extra that you were able to do and tack it on the next one. By the end, you get this big giant payment that you're making. That's huge. You can go towards your biggest ones. So pay off those, you know, I'm sorry to use this, this example for you animal lovers, but it's the animal kingdom and the big li the lions always look for the littlest ones, the, the weakest ones. That's what you're going to be. You're going to be a lion approaching your debt in that way. You're looking for the littlest one to pick it out of the herd and take it down. You're going to have that kind of bloodthirsty mentality when it comes to your creditors. Like, I'm, going to, I'm never going to have to hear from you again, you know, whatever bank you are. And Wells Fargo, you're out of here. And you're going to, and you're going to pay off that one and never have to hear from them again. And then you work on your next one, still making the minimum payments so you're not in trouble with the others. Okay. Um, then the next idea is to then, after you've done that, now you're going to start building your fund. Thousand dollars at first, and then actually some people recommend Dave Ramsey recommends have the thousand dollars first in your emergency fund, then pay off your debts so that you stop getting in debt. And then once you've done, start building three to six months worth. Okay. Maybe if you knew that, some of you that may be new information. If you knew that and you're not doing it, then, then you need to take a look at how can I actually be successful in actually starting to do that. I, I would look at it as to say, to get $1,000 in emergency fund, you can do. If your one of your family members needed $1,000 for emergency surgery, you would find a way. And if you take that same kind of mentality, I would work nights stocking shelves to get to $1,000 if I had to, to, to get life-saving surgery for somebody I knew. And so if I could do that then, if I have that same kind of urgency, I can create that emergency fund. Now I could stop the bleeding. No more bleeding. I, if I have an emergency, like the, the power, uh, <clears throat> the water softener goes out, guess what? I've got, not the, yeah, I've got the money in a bank. So it's not, I can rebuild that, but I didn't have to go into debt. Stop the bleeding. And now we start to, to address the wound. Okay. You have a, a lot of people that can help you with this. Um, you have professionals and, and we should just not try to do this alone. It's not a good idea. Um, there are a lot of resources. And so let's talk about what they are and what different ones do. For tax purposes, you have accountants and it's worth, uh, the many, most successful financial people say that it's worth, it's worth spending a little money on the people that will take care of your money. And you wanna be careful about who you do, but it's good. Uh, for example, getting your taxes done professionally, you might find might save lots of money in taxes and be well worth the money you spent on that person. So that you have your tax representatives. You have what's called a registered representative. Now let's use, look at the term difference between a financial planner and registered representative. Legally and technically, a financial planner is somebody who's, who you're paying them for their advice. They, they, they don't get paid by just going and putting you into things, but they get, they get paid for the advice. They, they're non-biased, they give you that financial advice. A registered representative will be free typically, 
um, and they will have access to a lot of options for you, but they get paid when you do something. And that is a perfectly legitimate, by the way, I used to be one of these. I used to work and do financial planning, uh, not financial planning. I used to do financial assistance through being a rep rep registered representative. I would sit down with people and I would talk about their insurance and retirement and their financial situation. And then I'd say, here's what I have to offer to help solve your, your, your challenges and accomplish your goals. So that's what a registered representative do, does. Be aware that they don't, since they don't get paid unless you do something, they're gonna want you to do something. And that's obvious, right? But those things they want you to do, like get insurance and retirement are good things to do. So um, it's, that's not a bad thing. Attorneys obviously can help with the legal issues of this. Bankruptcy, wills, trusts, uh, protecting your money against the people who, who are, have ill intent towards it and help you shelter that and those kind of things. Uh, okay, I'm gonna recommend a few few books to read. Uh, Till Debt Do Us Part. It was written um, here down in Provo. I live in, in Utah here and down in a professor at BYU wrote this book, Bernard Faduska, Till Debt Do Us Part. The thing I like about that is um, it really kind of explores some of the ways that what money means. It gets into the emotional issues, understanding what does money really represent. So I'm tackling those. Let's go back to an earlier example I gave. When I recognize that my problem with money is that I use it to cope, when I know I'm using it to cope, I am more likely to, that now what I can do, I'm trying to, sorry, my mouse isn't cooperating super well. I was hoping to, uh, some navigation issues with my mouse. I wanted to, I wanted to see what the chat says, but I'm gonna have to rely on you, Heather, to help me with that here in a moment, because I can't get my mouse to go to that spot. <laughs> it's disappeared on my screen. Um, if you so, control uh, and move your mouse, does it let you move it? Control. Well, no. no. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll just let you read those chats to me here in a moment when I get to that. But um, <clears throat> when I recognize that I'm spending as a way to cope, what I can then do is say, what other ways can I cope? Right? What's better? When I'm feeling down, what do I need to do instead of spending? What can I do? Uh, and that's when I start to look to and find better resources. I go find, I go exercise. I go running, I go do the breathing exercises, I connect. By the way, most addictions are really a deficit of connection. When you really look at addiction, addiction is usually a deficit of connection. In other words, I'm seeking a connection, a relationship, and I find it through alcohol, pornography, money, and many other things that are very weak substitutes. And what I really need is to, is to connect. The, the, there's a, a term called face it, replace it, and connect, FRC, where you face your challenge, you take an honest and hard look at it, and you say, what I feel like I need to do is spend right now. That is my, that is my desire, and I'm going to face it. I'm not going to run from it. Look, I, I want to spend. But when I really face it, I say, what does spending really do for me? It'll make me think I'm better for a moment, but it really doesn't. It's always disappointing. It always never quite does what I, what I hope it would do. And the item shows up from Amazon. God, it's just not quite, when I really look at it, it's not quite as fulfilling as I hoped it would be. And so what, are, what do I really need right now? What I really need is to manage and deal with this, this trigger I'm having. Am I, am I bored? Am I lonely? Am I angry? Am I stressed? Am I tired? What trigger am I facing in my life? And I'm going to face, I'm going to feel it. I'm going to sit with my anger. I'm going to sit with my boredom. I'm going to sit with whatever uncomfortable emotion I'm having and just be with that emotion. And after I've just kind of allowed for it to be there, I don't, I don't, I no longer have to be happy all the time. I just let myself deal with unpleasant feelings. And when I do, I find oh, I'm okay. I've got this. I can handle it. And then afterwards, I find a better way to connect. I'm not going to connect through, through another purchase. I'm going to connect by reaching out to a loved one, finding, finding that support, having a substantive, meaningful conversation with somebody I care about, connecting with myself better through reading a good book, uh, having some journaling time, time that I just really connect with nature, something that helps me feel like I'm really connecting to something deeper and more important. Now I'm getting really philosophical and deeper on you. I'm afraid if we don't do that, if you're not really dealing with the triggers, spending will always be the thing you wanna do. Um, maybe that's your challenge. Maybe it's not. 
but um, but it certainly could be one of the things that we need to look at. Uh, I've told you about The Richest Man in Babylon. Those are two old books. They've been around, and I love them both. There's a lot newer ones and more uh, new versions of some of the same principles, but I love those among the most. And then maybe getting a little help. And many of you, if not most, have this benefit through Blomquist Hill as an employee assistance program. And as you can already tell by what I've told you, I think often we, we know the basics of what we need to do with our money. It's just we struggle to get there. And if we can help, give us a call. Our counselors are, are ready and able to help sit down with you and talk about your money and your relationship with it and how we can create that and make a better relationship between you and your finances and also the people in your life as a result. That's my hope for you is that we, that we can be a part of that if we need to. There are great classes out there. This, this is a class, Dave Ramsey. We have no official connection. We don't get money for promoting it, but I think his principles are, are sound. And, the, and it's, a, it's a very fair, reasonable cost. Usually, uh, last I checked, it's like $105 and included a very sharp, nice kit that may have gone up since then, but uh, that, that comes with a book, um, some, some materials that go along with the class, like the DVDs of the class. Uh, I imagine it's all online now. It used to be um, in person. You could find places all throughout the country and by various other countries where you could go and, um, and attend. And attend. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, Utah Saves is something here in Utah for those that are, live here. If, if you don't live here, I apologize for, for promoting that one. But if you're in another state, they have a, a most states have a program like this where there's even benefits and some funding that's gone into giving people, um, you know, little rewards for, for, for saving and, and they help you along the way. Fair Credit Foundation, faircredit.org is a great nonprofit organization. And there's Feed the Pig is another one that I'm told about. I don't know a lot about that one personally, but I know that's one that you could look into. So here we are. I'd like to kind of get uh, your thoughts and questions. A couple things. If you, uh, um, maybe Heather can share some of the comments, and then I'd also be interested if you want to share in the comments any any little pointers. At your many times we learn from each other, so I'd be interested in your ideas about what works, what's worked for you. Also your questions, so we can address that and tell us kind of what we're missing, what we haven't discussed, and what we can help you with. So maybe Heather, can you share the any yeah. comments that we've had so far, so we can start with that. Yeah, definitely. So the first one is, it says post-divorce, IRA's gone, 50K in debt, looking for next steps. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And should they get help from a planner? Good. Thank you for willing to share that. You know, uh, so I know that you mentioned post-divorce. I know that's a financial event that causes, it's a financial disruption, right? Um, and so I, 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 I can see the financial stress of that. Post-divorce, can read the rest to me again? I just want to uh, 50,000 post divorce, the IRA is gone, 50k in debt, and I'm looking for next steps. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna tell you your next step is to accept where you are. I know your dreams have been changed a little bit. You probably, based on all of that, you nobody goes into a marriage hoping it will end. Your dream has changed that way. And, and, and by the way, I hope that you found that that can be okay, right? That that can be that you can build a new dream in your life and that can be the, a positive step in the right direction. Um, financially, it's the same thing. You know, we, you, your dream of having an IRA at this stage in your life, you, you'd, you'd hope you have something saved. That's gone. And we have to mourn that a little bit and just be okay to say, you know what, that hurts and let that kind of be a grief. There's a grief in loss all the time. So grieve the loss, accept where you are, and then start to say, now what does it look like? My, Maybe a little different than what I planned, but or it's not. I'm, I want the same goals. How am I going to get there? So yes, financial planning. I'd recommend if for many of you, your employers will do some of this. It's a part of your 401k plan. If you have an employer who has a 401k, it often comes with kind of a free consultation with your financial planner that administers that. Check with your HR. Find out what's available to you through your employer um, to have consultations about your retirement. If you, if you have a retirement plan at your employer. If you don't, you could seek again, uh, registered representatives, talk to the people that live around you, get, get warm recommendations of people they trust mm -hmm. that are around them uh, and find who's good at this and can sit down with you and they have great tools. Uh, your banks often have free tools. Uh, 
Look at your bank or credit union. Sometimes they have free tools. Mine does. And it's a free tool I can fill out online to answer a bunch of questions and get some assistance with that. So take advantage of the resources already available to you. Sometimes that will reduce the cost involved. Um, and, and then, by the way, yes, I would recommend then that you talk to somebody. If, if you're having spending challenges and that kind of thing and you'd like some help with a counselor, then talk to a counselor as well. If you feel like there's some emotional, personal, behavioral habit changes that need to take place, that's where a counselor could come in as well. Hey, okay. the next one is just, they're just kind of making a comment on what works for them. They said, doing a budget is the hardest. I have a savings account that my work automatically puts a certain amount into it from my paycheck, but with the kids getting older, the budget needs to be raised all the time. The extra money that I put in the savings is like an emergency fund, fund and my funny, fun money or shopping gifts. So that was just a comment on what they do to help save. Good. Yeah, it's a good comment. And, you know, it is, it is challenging, but recognizing that maybe you need to adjust that and having an employer who, who helps contribute to, sees the importance of saving and, and, and it creates a plan to help you save. That's wonderful. You know, um, that's what we do. Um, my wife and I have, we have joint accounts, so they're separate, but then they become joint. And so what we can do is her, my savings is for one thing, hers is for another thing. And really it means it's our savings, but we just know that this account means this, this account means that. Yeah, and having a fun money account, I like that. Uh, letting it build up for a few months towards something bigger is great. Or if this month it's about smaller things, let's use it then too. But I'm a big believer, if your budget doesn't have a fun money expendable, like give that's the built-in flexibility. If it doesn't have that, it needs to. You need to find a way to create just a little, even if it's $50 that month, right? Something allows you to have a little bit of flexibility and, and um, fun with it. For that comment. And then someone asked, what is the difference between a will and a trust? Ah. Do you think is better? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say that I'm not the right person to give the best. This is where I gotta be careful with my license. I am not, um, the, the rugged, most brief explanation is a, a, a trust is more of a place and a will is more of a document. A trust is a thing you put money into a will is, is your, your, wishes expressed about that. That's a very rugged, and many financial people would say that's a horrible explanation, but that my best understanding, a will is sort of a document that becomes official about what you want your money done with your money. A trust is how is a place you can put that money. In, in a sense, it's a way of, it's still a document in a sense, but it's a way that you're defining where your money is. So trust can be how you protect your money from Wills don't really necessarily protect your money in the same way because a trust is a place you can put your money. A family trust is a way that when you die, instead of going into probate and now the government is involved, you can protect and have a, a place where that goes. That's a, a rugged de definition of that. But that's where I would say, for if, if you're in, the, in that field where you're looking at the difference between a will and a trust and you want to do something with that, talk to um, an accountant, a, a legal tax representative or a financial planner, and they will have that more detailed explanation but but by the way thanks for bringing that up because wills and trusts are are absolutely necessary right you want to protect your assets you want to find the best way to put your places to put your money protect it from taxes lawsuits and things that can happen to you good good question okay then someone said what was the face it replace it dot 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 then what was it okay frc face it replace it connect has been powerful um, idea and it has different ways people have branded it. Um, but face it, replace it, connect is the idea that when, when facing a tempter, <laughs> a challenge or a trigger, instead of a, instead of like, okay, I, I've been trying to lose weight. And when I see the cupcake sitting on the counter, the, the mentality of it's, oh my gosh, that cupcake is powerful. It's, it's shiny. It's beautiful. I want it so much. And if I take kind of a white knuckle, close my eyes to it approach and I actually give it more power. Like it becomes even more beautiful in my mind. It's the taboo. It's the thing I'm not supposed to have. Whereas, you know, when I wasn't dieting, I said, oh, there's a cupcake. I think I'll have it or I think I won't. Sometimes we give it more power when we can't have it. The can't is the key word that makes it more powerful over us. So facing it is a way of saying, you know what? I actually could. I could absolutely eat that cupcake or I could go spend that money. I could. I'm not going to have that prohibitive uh, approach to it because when I do that I give it more power I could the question is do I want to 
So instead of shoulding, I'm sorry, but it's a comment we sometimes we should on ourselves. We should where we just talk about could and what's best for us. So instead of giving me the should statements, which really give it more power, I just say, you know, I could, I could eat that cupcake, but, but think about it. That's, that's 450 calories that I could put to use somewhere else and get a lot more value from it, right? I, 450 calories, I could have a nice meal. I could draw that out and I'm not spending all my calories on one little cupcake, but it, maybe today it's worth it. I'm gonna, I'd rather do it that way. But it's, it's how, again, we're budgeting our calories, or in this case, our money to say, I could absolutely do that. There's ways to do it. Just, so I'm facing it. I'm, I'm having a conversation with it. And then I when, I, when I decided it's not good for me, I'm replacing the cupcake. If I just I'm focused on the cupcake, it's still gonna have power over me. I'm replacing it with what I really want. What I really want is I'm going to replace it with something else. I'm, what, what's more meaningful for me? What I want is I'm going to go have something healthier, or in this case, I'm going to spend my money on this. I'm replacing it with what, what I really want. And then I'm connecting. I'm connecting. I'm finding that what I really need is connection right now. I'm going to go sit down. I'm going to talk to somebody. I might even say, man, I, I really am having a cupcake moment. Um, uh, can you sit and talk with me? <laughs> or I could just kind of focus on something else altogether. So face it, replace it, and connect. Because remember I said that most addictive behaviors, most problematic behaviors, problems, are, are deficits of connection. We really wanna connect. All of the connecting that we're doing sometimes is not getting deep enough. And in our modern day of social media, we live a, a mile wide, but an inch deep. So I would say maybe not a mile wide, maybe shorten, things and go deeper. Our relationships ought to be deeper. I, I think we're, we're, we're broadening, but we're going thin and, and shallow in our meaningful relationships. Seek People who seek deeper and more meaningful relationships and connections with people find they need less of these distracting problematic behaviors. Face it, replace it, and then connect. Okay. Else, the next one is, which I don't know if you're in the place to answer this either, but it says, is a 401k better or a Roth IRA for savings? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do both. They each have an advantage. Well, they're about when do you want your money to be protected from being taxed? And so the answer is yes, because it depends on your situation. If, if you're going to, when do you want it to be protected? Do you want it to be protected while you're, while you're paying into it? And then that's kind of the idea of that I, I, it's pre-tax, meaning that it's protected now. And so later I will have to pay on taxes on everything that was created. That's one idea. Well, I think I'll be in a lower tax bracket then, so I'm okay with that. Or would I rather it be protected? Did I get that reverse? I hope I said that right. Would I rather just pay into it now and pay all the taxes on what I put into it so later I don't have to pay the taxes? It's a rugged overview. But the, the, yes, and some, some people do a little bit of combination of both to have a little diversity, but um, that's where you would want to look at your specific situation, your tax planner at your organization, if they have a 401k, they could sit down with you and talk with you in more detail about your situation and your bank and people like that. But, um, but they both are good. I, I've yet to talk to a financial planner who said that one of them is a bad idea. <laughs> they all say they're both good. It's just a matter of when do you want to shelter your money from taxes? And then there's a, there's a growth implication of that too. How it grows could be different, right? There's a reason if I put more into it now, there's more grow. It's growing faster because I'm putting more in, and it, there's just there's a little, little more to it. But how do you want it to grow, and how do you want it to be protected from taxes? Okay. Then the next one is they. It's kind of more of a scenario. So it says. Um, they have the money, but they get anxiety when they're deciding on what to purchase, particularly big items. How do mm. we deal with that? I would say that one thing is be grateful for that. <laughs> I hope it's not a debilitating, heartful anxiety, but listen to that. That, that. that part of you that's saying, I'm scared to spend this much money. You know what that's called? That's preservation. If you didn't have a little of that, boy, we just we just spend and spend and people that don't have any anxiety at all or have a bigger problem than what you might be facing right now. So be grateful that, that, that there's something in you. It's a little alarm. It's saying, this is scary. Pay attention to it, but don't let it control you, right? Don't that when, when a little anxiety, a little, little fear, a little trepidation is healthy, when it becomes debilitating and I, I find I'm just not ever buying the car I need or, 
of the house or and, I, and I'm living with a, a mountain of money and I won't spend any of it, then I think, okay, now it's gone it's gone over. I need to address and, and see that I'm safe. It's okay to spend. And, and then, so recognizing that you, you might have to push through that a little bit, right. When it's time that, that, that feeling might be there, but be grateful for it and then manage it through information, knowledge, right. When you understand that, you know, it's, it's, you do your best to arm yourself with information to say, look, I'm ready. And if this, what's the worst case scenario, if that happens, this is my plan kind of just kind of work through that and, and arm yourself with information about that. If it's, if you do all of that and it's still just an anxiety, sometimes we're left with the feelings that no longer fit the situation. Then just address the feelings, right? You've already done everything to logically work through it. You've decided to make the purchase. You, you see the wisdom in it, but the feelings just follow you anyway. Recognize that sometimes that'll happen. Long after they've, they've served their purpose, feelings might follow you. In which case you address the feelings. You just kind of soothe as adults. We need to learn how to soothe ourselves. We did it as babies. Uh, we learned how to, to soothe by, by sucking our thumb or cooing or it's what we did. And as adults, maybe we <laughs> need to update our soothing strategies and just find ways to kind of calm yourself and say, I'm feeling anxious, but it's okay. It's that self-talk. It's sitting with our emotions, allowing them to work through us. And that is certainly an area where I think a counselor could help if you're finding it really difficult is how do we soothe? How do we manage those troubling emotions when they come up. Okay, and then the last one's just kind of a comment. So they said, I'm building a shop house and the bank would not loan me any money because it's a non-traditional loan. Mm -hmm. We decided we would go to family to borrow, borrow. It is a great place to go. We thought we were out of options. Um, we have good family. However, this might not be good for everyone. Just a thought. It is. A, it's a good idea. And, and you know, some people are really scared of going to, to family. But there are times that, that can work, you know, that can be mutually beneficial. Um, we have to be, be, be conscientious and careful, but you just gave a good example of how it can work and it can be mutually beneficial. People sometimes want to help, right? People are looking for opportunities to be of assistance. And if you're a responsible person and you would have paid the bank and they can see that, I'm not totally opposed to that all, sometimes. Um, I, that's okay. Just be conscientious and careful. And if you're in a position don't ever, the, the, the litmus test is don't ever let it affect your relationships. As the person lending money, a rule of thumb is when you give that money, at, tell yourself, if I never get this back, can I maintain a good relationship with that person? Can I be okay with that? And if the answer is yes, then go ahead and lend the money. If the answer is no, you might want to rethink that because even something could happen. And if they can't pay you back, and if that gets in the way of that relationship, their relationship is more important than them having the money for that. So assuming that you both look at it the situation and say how strong is our relationship can we handle it and yes but yeah proceed with caution you're for every story I hear like that i hear stories where it goes south and becomes a real problem so tread carefully but it can be um for both parties it can be very I, I love it i've i've been in that position i've been on both sides of that in my life and it's nice to be able to help someone else out and i'm glad they felt like they could I, it's tragic when you find out they they went without or something happened because they couldn't so it's great when family can be there for each other. That's what we're here for, isn't it? We're here to help. So thanks for sharing that. Okay, that's all of the questions or comments. So all right, and that's kind of all of our time too. So yep. thanks for coming. I hope something was of value for you. And again, I just remind you that take take this information and, and if, it's, if you learned nothing new today, then I would just say, Take stock of what you knew and how, ask yourself how well you're doing. I hope you learned something. I hope maybe even if it's an important reminder for you, I hope there's been something there. But again, let's turn it, let's take us out of our memory center and put it into our habit place. So even if you forgot everything you learned, it becomes a habit. And that just happens by starting to do it. Do it every day. And by the way, building a habit means stealing a stimulus. If your habit, if the thing that made you spend money was a stimulus, a, a kind of remind, take borrow from that and create a new habit with it. So thank you again for being here. Have a blessed day, everybody, and, and hopefully we'll see you at a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.